Hey everyone, welcome to Contest Prep University. I'm Joe Klimzeski with Adam Atkinson, and this is going to be our last coaching behind the scenes episode for a while. We have done this to, to round out the year to try and take a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the topics that we hit more topically in terms of five, six, seven minute segments. And we're going to return to that after this episode. But Adam, as I was looking through everything that we have done, I thought this was going to be perfect timing to cover pre-contest planning. So the season at the time of us recording this just finished. A lot of people are already spinning around and they're getting ready to start the new year with, with new, new pre-contest plans or getting ready to dive into that type of season transition. And uh, I, I find myself having these conversations a lot here as we prepare people for the holidays and then the beginning of the year. And that is, you know, how do we want to make that transition? Do we dive right into a, a deep calorie deficit and, and go for it? Or are we looking for a, a subtle transition incrementally? And I know there are a lot of variables that come into play in terms of the speed at which people need to lose body fat for the particular contest on the calendar. So how do you start these kinds of conversations with your clients? What are you looking for? Yeah. Well, the first thing we got to look at is how, how is the off season going? And uh, we get this all the time where we feel like maybe someone's not quite responding the way we would hope in their off season. Uh, is it a tracking error? Is it um, accuracy? Um, and if those come up, the person's usually just typically not even ready to dive into a prep yet. Because if you can't track when food is higher, you know, how are we going to do it when it's lower? Now, some people do better when they diet. Um, we all have those people who turn it on a thousand percent when we say go. Um, but I think that's a good first place to start is you know, making sure that that person's even ready to have that conversation based on how their reverse and how their off-season planning is going. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a particular way that I liked to do it personally, and, and I'd love your opinion to see if this is a tactic that you use with some of your clients. But I always felt like I, I personally did have very good productive off-seasons. I, I was very intentional about that. So uh, once I became a pro, I would typically only compete every two years. So I really, I really had accomplished everything I wanted in that off season. So getting a, a turn toward pre-contest was pretty exciting. I, I didn't, I didn't view it with any dread whatsoever. I was, I was ready to go out of the gate strong. And I would almost use a, a one or two week induction phase where I would really kind of go for it, almost, almost kind of a, a little bit of a purging. So I, I might drop my carbs down to 100 or 150 grams. Fat for me was always pretty typically low, 20% or less in terms of percent of calories. And I just like to make sure I got my own attention, so to speak. I was, you know, this is serious business. You're going to go into this. And then I would modulate back up just a little bit into what I would consider, you know, the first sustainable steps. And, and so that may be, you know, another 50 grams of, of carbs or, or I may actually start some higher calorie days at that point where that first week or two, I did not, I didn't have any increased days whatsoever. So I, I liked to kind of punch myself in the face to, to, to get my own attention and then enter the pre-contest with that kind of, of zeal. Is that, is that something you do? Or are you saying that's, that's too extreme, Joe? I would never do that with a client. Well, that first cut usually has to be pretty big. And uh, I do agree that gets people engaged. It gets them excited about progress. Um, again, you don't want to be the rabbit in the race necessarily, but that's, that's a good way to start the race strong. And uh, I definitely agree that, uh, you know, if you are losing, in fact, too much, too fast, you can always bring food back up. Now, now another tactic that I use probably more often with my clients is the exact opposite, which is like you mentioned, you know, we're, we're not in off season anymore. We got to recalibrate and start really putting the, the screws down on accuracy and objectivity. So let's, let's understand that any amount of reduction is going to have a positive effect. And so let's make it very doable. So I almost kind of put the training wheels on my clients because I just felt like that's, that's a better way to ease into it. 
but you know, occasionally there are clients as crazy as me and, and, and I might do that. Absolutely. And all of these methods kind of matter on like maybe how aggressive we might have to be with somebody. What's the timeline of their prep looking like? And uh, me and you are both advocates of longer prep. So I think we tend to start off more gentle, um, more often than not. And uh, for me, especially, um, there are a lot of variables that athletes can clean up on in the off season. So if they're having untracked meals versus refeeds, um, if they're not doing any cardio, these are all small things that you can change to make a pretty big impact out the gates. And we kind of talked about that in our last um, episode, but you know, this is why I like to keep cardio low in the off season is just so now we have things we can add that can make a pretty significant impact. Yeah, and, and really good point on making sure that we're we're being able to manage all the variables in terms of metabolic capacity and sustainability. So one of the things that I had on my my note card to discuss as a transition is, you know, to to perceive ahead of time some of those breaks you may need, you know, to understand that there will be transitions that your metabolism is going to start to reduce a little bit as you get leaner and healthier and, and there's just less demand on your body. Um, but also knowing that when you get way toward the end, which we can kind of save toward the end of this podcast, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna be looking at time as an equal variable to progress. In other words, you may be able to lose four or five pounds in the first week or two at the beginning. It may take you four or five weeks to lose the last pound or two. And so that reversal of really looking at time and consistency as an important variable means you have to plan for that. And uh, so, so hence you saying that you and I are, are advocates of longer preps. It's not that we're dieting harder or longer. It's just that you not only want to make sure that you can reach that end goal in your best condition, ready to go, but that you're also anticipating some of those shifts where you may have to make some changes. And in those, in those transitions, there, there could be a week or two that you're not making the exact same kind of progress you thought would be linear all the way through. Yeah. And uh, just making, making room for error or um, stalls injuries can fall into that too. Um, so it's not just uh, you know, um, metabolic decline, um, you know, we want to schedule diet breaks and things like that in there. So um, the more weeks you have to work, the better the outcome typically. And, you know, I think you could always anticipate some, some holidays, some birthdays, some trips or something like that. And so just to know that you've got the time so that every week doesn't have to be do or die. But another, another method that worked personally for me, and, and, and I do have a harder time applying this to clients as well, because you, you just never want to push somebody harder than is necessary and, and possibly create some kind of a stumbling block for them. But I, I was always okay with a little bit of extra work, a little bit more sacrifice, a little bit higher reduction in calories to make sure that I'm on pace so that uh, if, if I did have a, a higher calorie day on the weekend or something else, I, I just always have that little bit of anxiety in the back of my mind where you don't want to get behind. You don't want to get behind and you always want to be ahead of the game. You know, you're not, you're not on time unless you're ahead of a schedule. Those are the kind of mantras that go through my mind. So I, I try and convey that same sense of urgency to clients. But again, that, that longer prep means that if, if there are some slowdowns, you can manage them without pushing somebody physically harder than, than they may be able. Yeah, absolutely. And we've all had clients, they get down to the wire and there's no choice, but to go down and maybe you only have two or three weeks like that, but you feel like you're playing catch up the whole time. <laughs> And it, it usually doesn't end in the best result or the outcome that we're typically used to where we're reversing somebody into the show. And, uh, you know, for some reason, the 12 week prep mentality still has not quite died. Um, hmm. You still see a lot of people doing that. And uh, 
just because they can do that doesn't mean they should. And it doesn't mean even though they're getting on stage and looking good, it doesn't mean that that's the absolute best outcome. You know, you know, this being a coaching behind the scenes episode, my, my premise for that idea was to really kind of expose the inner thoughts of, of a good coach. You know, what are, what are we thinking when we're working with clients? And, and I was just doing a podcast this morning with Joe Shretz, who's a, a younger pro who is, is really just getting started with his own coaching and in and, and his own professional career. And, and I made the point that the more seasons you go through, when you get into that second decade or so of competing, you, you find that you're learning how to compete. You're learning a lot of things that you just didn't have the experience to know prior. And as we're talking about, you know, try to pick that, that one point on the calendar and say, okay, here's my contest. Here's where I'm going to look my best. That may become a little bit easier, but I still think it's great to have a little bit of a, of a gradient. So for example, if I have a client who says, I want to compete here, 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 and here, I know the later shows, we're going to have a potential to look better just because we have a little extra time to get a little leaner if we need to, or they've gotten lean enough. And now we can be in a metabolic building phase upward. There, there are just so many reasons why somebody's typically going to look their best. So if you are a client and you are creating your own schedule, consider that, you know, everybody likes to talk about, you know, Hey, I want to do a warm up show. I don't, I don't like a warm up show as, as if it's a throwaway. Like, I don't care how I look. I just want to get on stage. No, you should, you should schedule a show to look your best knowing that maybe two or three or four weeks later, you'll look even better, but that could even be something like a photo shoot. It could be something where it's just something on the calendar where you're saying here, this is, this is do or die. I'm putting it all on the table for this, knowing that then your next couple of shows are probably going to be where you really hit your stride. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree with you. I'd never like that term warm up show because you know, you want to go in and, play and play big and uh, you should be ready for your uh, warm-up show maybe it's not your most important show um, you know if you have a national show um, but you know you really do want to bring it still how, how do you anticipate training and and uh, do you plan this out ahead of time with your clients are, are there certain segments of the pre-contest phase where you say okay here's what we're going to do for six weeks or eight weeks or Here's how we're going to transition. What, what conversations uh, go through your, your client list? Yeah, so, you know, it starts with the training design. And I usually won't design longer than like six to eight weeks. And uh, honestly, based off of that, um, if someone does six weeks or eight weeks, they're progressing on the same program. They're just repeating it two more weeks. But with that being said, it really comes down to the feedback that they're giving me. And this is where my auto regulation comes into play. Um, you know, if I have a client who's really sore, they're really having a hard time recovering, rather than digging in and changing their whole training program or giving them a deload week that they have to mess with, I would rather just give them some days off from the gym. And then sometimes even cardio can come into play with that. I might say, let's train four days this week versus, you know, five or maybe six if they're doing six. But um, that is really kind of how I adjust training. Towards the end, those volumes might go down so they have a little more room for cardio. Or I might throw some more cardio type variables into their training just to keep their heart rate up. And uh, it's not really that the higher reps are um, doing anything special for them in terms of uh, muscle growth. Um, it, it's more I'm just keeping them moving, um, keeping their training interesting, and uh, gain that. I'm more after that calorie burn versus uh, moving the heavy weights at that point in time. Now, that usually comes after, you know, like a five by five squat or something like that. But um, I do like to mix those variables in there. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you use the phrase auto-regulate because when you are in the throes of the contest diet and, and you're feeling a lot of low energy days, 
there there does have to be a realization that that that's more of the norm than not and sometimes you just have to push your way through it other times though you really do just need the day off you need to be able to say okay i do not have it today probably risking injury very counterproductive right now for me to continue so i'm just going to pack it in and come back tomorrow maybe just do some light cardio today instead and you know, the way, the way I look at an off season is typically as, as calorie surplus has been maintained, or even if that's leveled off, body weight is now at its peak at the end of an off season. And I've, I've probably helped somebody go through a lot of strength building as well as hypertrophy work because the calorie surplus is going to lend itself to that. So usually training frequency is maybe down training intensity is pretty high because we're really going after maximum strength work at the end of that off season. So it's, it's really a good time to just start incrementally adding more volume. If somebody, for example, has been training three days a week at the very end of that off season, then I may go to four. Then as you said, after six to eight, maybe 12 weeks, we go up to five. And then we may even top out at six at some point, knowing that the workouts are going to be smaller going to probably be isolating out some body parts a little bit, uh, you know, more finely so that you're not in the gym as long, but it's still not a time to necessarily just throw away any hope for heavy training. Like, like you said, that's, that's not the goal, but you also don't want to just revert to not pushing yourself hard. I, obviously everybody knows you, you need to keep stimulating the muscle tissue as much as you can to maintain it, even though you may not be getting new, new PRs in the gym. So I, I always found myself again, as I, as I learned how to manage my pre-contests year after year after year, I, I, I kind of had a threshold where I knew, okay, if this was my top squad in the off season, I, I'm okay settling down to here. Like I, even in my, my best condition, four or 5% body fat, I still want to be able to squat at this level. So there may be a little bit of a decline over time in strength, but that still gave me a strength goal. It was fighting mm -hmm. to maintain at least those levels. And I think that's also a, a critical mindset for pre-contest training. Yeah. One prep, I actually kept track of my coefficient throughout my uh, journey. And I found like that middle point where I was around like 188 pounds, uh, my strength versus my body weight was at its best. And then mm -hmm. Basically, any pounds I dropped under that, it really plummeted, uh, mainly my squat. I just didn't have that uh, almost uh, like mechanical strength uh, due to my stomach being larger to push on my legs to help me get that squat up. <laughs> so what about transitioning toward your contest? You, you and I love, of course, to have as much time as we can to be increasing calories, but obviously if you had a hundred clients, you may have a hundred different paths that you're taking based on where they are. But if you, if you could take a client who's going for a, a personal record, look, you know, they've got their best chance of, of winning and doing their best ever this particular season. What's, what's your methodology or your, your approach to let's say that last month, what are you looking to try to accomplish? Yeah. I, I do want to make sure the body is de-stressed. Um, it's going to create an optimal hormonal environment, whether that be um, a progesterone steel or a testosterone steel um, due to prep. Um, you can see those levels get lowered. It's really important to be hormonally optimized before you start your contest prep because you and I both know that these levels decline pretty heavily when you go through the stress of a prep. And this is why we do diet breaks, refeeds, and things of that nature. So making sure I have a good hormonal environment um, prior to starting the prep. And I do find that keeping stress low, whether it's environmental, physical, um, can be a really good option. So um, a great example, I just had a uh, female work with me her whole year of an off season. We actually decided to take this whole month off from communication or even me writing her training. I said, let's let you train. Um, here's your parameters as far as how many days a week. But I just wanted her to go in, enjoy her own training, 
before I start programming for her again. And then also, I'm just really minimizing stress. And I think with her, just having a month of not checking in with me is going to be really good for her. Mm. It, it's really interesting. I've, I've often told clients that as well when we've worked on some things for a long period of time. I have a client just this week that, you know, it was his renewal time. And I, and I said, look, I've, I've enjoyed our time together, but we have worked together for eight years. And um, every time this time of year comes around, I, I kind of anticipate you to say, okay, I've, I've had enough. I'm going to go on my own. I, I'm, not, I'm not pushing you away. Don't want you to leave. But I just <laughs> want to let you know, if you ever want to do something on your own, I would help you make that transition. You can still check in with me once in a while. You know, I, I just don't want you to feel codependent with me. And even if it's in a short time frame, like you did with your client, I think it does kind of almost cleanse the palate a little bit of that coaching relationship and you can come back fresh. Like you, you go experiment a little bit, have some fun. You don't need me looking over your shoulder. So that's a really, really good idea, Adam. Yeah. And I think that uh, not every client's going to fall into that category. I have people who that would be a nightmare. Like a, I've had people who have been with me for years and, um, they've just never missed a check-in and uh, you wonder what they would do if they did. But uh, I, I think that's going to work really well for her. And uh, a lot of why she struggled in her last prep was, uh, you know, her coach just kept giving her more cardio and less food. And uh, she really needed a diet break and uh, actually a little bit longer of a metabolic building phase. So um, starting her prep in almost the opposite standpoint is going to feel really good for her. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I was just thinking with a client as I saw her posting some of her, you know, contest pictures this week. And I was going back to what I was feeling and thinking and analyzing in that moment versus retrospectively now, you know, taking a, a, a 2020 hindsight look. And I thought, you know, somebody who is, is that ectomorphic, maybe our best bet would be to really reduce cardio really i mean she, she did great you know she's a pro who has has won shows and, and so forth but um I'm like man what's what's that next level you know what's the next thing that could just make her unstoppable and and i've heard people talk a lot about the fact that you know hey this one weird contest season i had an injury i couldn't even train for two weeks before the show could barely pose for a couple of weeks, but kind of limped into the show and ended up looking my best ever. And it really speaks to just so much overtraining and, and being in that calorie deficit for so long that sometimes toward the end, more rest can really be what you need. And so I'm, it, it's one of the reasons why I've always practiced that metabolic building principle as a way to lead as many clients as possible into the show. So you have a calorie increase coming up. Hopefully we can pull, you know, cardio back a little bit and, and even training frequency if, if we need to give yourself more sleep. Uh, you can work on some of those intangibles like posing. And that's typically the, always the best answer versus accelerating and grinding harder and harder and harder and harder all the way up to the show. Yeah. Um, I kind of like to call that the beat the person into the ground method. Hmm. And, uh, you know, some people just genetically, they can do that. Um, but it's more a matter of when that catches up to them, not if. And uh, we, we see this all the time. Um, and I actually just had this happen where a woman was with a coach for four years and uh, she's like, I can't get lean anymore, but she's never really had a break. So mm -hmm. it's just caught up with her. Well, I think, uh, as, as we said, everybody has a, a different trajectory. We are all in different phases of our careers. And when you're planning these pre-contests, it, it's important to, to kind of construct what you think is going to be that perfect model, hopefully with enough buffer in there. If, if you take my perspective, which is, you know, never let yourself get behind, always be ahead then when you've got those blocks of time, when you feel good and you can really make the progress, I think it's gonna be beneficial. You, you'll always find that then when those slower weeks are there, you can withstand them better. 
But um, Adam, I think this was a great way to end this particular series and the year. What what a year to end. Anybody looking at these timestamps will know that we are we are finishing 2020, which hopefully historically will be the worst year and only only better ones to come. But uh, as we regroup for 2021, uh, Adam and I are going to work on new series and new angles for those topics, get back into our, our shorter cadence where we're giving you five-minute uh, topical, hard-hitting uh, episodes. So with that, Adam, thanks again for another great year. And yes. uh, all you guys watching and listening, thanks for your support. And we will see you in 2021.